Okay, so what we'll do, the way we'll run it is that I generally don't prepare a talk before I do it because it always depends on who's going to be in the room. So I, don't, I never put together a set talk and then it kind of has nothing to do with who I'm talking to. So I'm going to give a few of the fundamentals. What we'll do at the end though is I'll leave time for questions because most people have specific questions that they'll want answered. Um, usually it'll be covered within a talk, but I like to leave the time at the end so that you guys can ask questions in a kind of a Q&A as well. So I'll leave like 20 minutes at the end for that. So if you do have things come up, please uh, make a note of them. If you're not going to remember them, just make a note, write it down, anything like that. And we'll cover those at the end. Uh, otherwise, yeah, we'll get started. So welcome. Uh, for those that don't know me, my name's Tom. I'm a holistic health practitioner. I'm also a photographer and videographer, and uh, I became somewhat known this year because I put a video out when coronavirus came out, and it was about viruses, the nature of viruses, and the nature of the world that we live in. So since then, I've been making subsequent videos about the way of the body of the mind, the way of the world, how we relate to ourselves and how we relate to the world around us, and how that really how fundamentally our health is the biggest part of our journey in life. And a lot of people here at this conference are here because, you know, we're here to experience more and develop more of our spiritual side, like who we are and what we're doing, what's our development, how does it relate to the time that we're in and how does it relate to the world around us. And one of the things that I see from dealing with a lot of clients over the years is that sometimes there's some fundamental steps that I feel have been missed in relation to the physical body. So if we all come from the premise that we are a soul having a physical experience, so we're a soul with a body, you might think that one of the fundamental tenets of spirituality is learning how to have that body, how to look after it. It's the vehicle with which we experience the world and our experience can be diminished or improved depending on how well our physical structure resonates with the spirit that's in it. So today's talk is really about the fundamentals of health. How do we have a vibrant and healthy physical body? And how does that relate also to having a vibrant and healthy uh, spiritual body? So we'll cover all of that today. Mostly it'll be basics, but sometimes, coming. Sometimes, you know, the basics are what we miss. And I have dealt with a lot of people who, who do have vast knowledge in certain areas, but then going through some of their appraisals, like a, when I kind of do an assessment at the start, I'm like, how did you miss this like step two how, how is it that you never even kind of contemplated that or or came to that conclusion or learnt about it so if anything does seem overly basic just know that a lot of the answers to the bigger questions come from the fundamental basics so try not to brush over anything that does seem overly basic and again if you already know these sorts of things sometimes it might be a good reminder but again if there's something that you want to be you want to expand on do just jot it down and, um, and we'll cover it. You can put your hand up halfway through as well, that's fine, but if I think we're gonna cover it later, I'll, I'll let you know. So I've made a few couple of notes here that I'll stick to just so I don't go for three hours and go over the time. So to start with, the four bodies that we're primarily made of, there are many more. We have etheric bodies, subtle bodies, astral bodies, but the four primary bodies that we're made of are the physical, the, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual. They're the primary bodies because they, they really determine the state of health because they all interrelate very strongly with each other. Now, the physical body is the least creative of the four bodies that we have, that we're made up of. Now, some people might disagree. They might think, well, I'm a dancer. I'm, I'm an artist. I'm really creative. I use my body to create. But if we consider that the body itself is just made up of physical elements, we're basically a carbon-based life form. And those elements don't animate themselves. Without the spirit, we're just a pile of elements. So then we have to start asking, well, then how do we become animated? How does that happen? So then we have to expand through the larger series of bodies to find out where that animation comes from that animates this physical existence into something that can interpret and communicate and to exude and to resonate. So that's kind of why we need to look at each body, not just individually, but in concert with each other. So the physical body is generally the smallest. The one outside of that is said to be the emotional. Now that's the, the body of the feeling. It's really close because we feel very strongly based on our physicality. We, we interpret and we relate to feelings very strongly through and with the physical body. Outside of that, we have the mental body or the body of the mind. It's a little bigger again. And in the mind, because the mind is getting closer to finding a, uh, a higher source. It's beyond feeling and it's where we can start to make uh, extrapolations into where we might come from or what we're doing here and we get into thought 
that's a bit of a dead end for some people. That's why people of high intellect, they might be extremely smart and intelligent, but they can they can degrade themselves into a really depressed state of life because they don't comprehend a higher source than that. Like what is it that is creating my mind and where is the end of mind and where does that where does that mind essentially end? So that's why people like Einstein, although they had a lot of great, um, you know, additions to life and some say you know well if was there freemasonry involved and blah 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 but beyond that if there wasn't you know they they still died somewhat depressed because they couldn't figure out that last element and it's like a lot of intellects when they say there's no such thing as god because i can't intellectualize god well then they miss out on that fundamental feeling of um connection yeah absolutely and complete safety and security within life because then you, you it's, a, it's a feeling so that comes back down the chain back to the feelings so then the spiritual body is the largest and the spiritual body because that is where we are beyond our physical existence. That's where we are in the etheric form and where we are where we face infinity and we face unconditional love and we face many of the things that we don't quite comprehend through the, the lower bodies. Now, it's not just a case of the physical is the smallest and the spiritual is, is the largest and then it's a one-way street because while we might have an ailment in the soul or the spiritual body that will show up as an ailment or a manifestation in the physical body but it can go the other way if we're assaulted heavily by somebody right now we take a wound or something that also ends up in the spiritual body so it's not a one-way street it always goes both ways yeah when you say spiritual wound are you talking about entities aspects can be yeah yep yeah but just something simple as in uh if we usually it's what we carry through into this life so if we haven't resolved something higher up, a, a mental, like something within our unconscious or something in our emotional body, some traumas or something in the spiritual body, that might show up purely as something that's an ailment of the physical, either pain or it could be something like a tumor or some kind of, um, come in, some kind of chronic long-term illness that's based on a higher series of bodies. And sometimes, yeah, it might have come from way back that we have to go through in order to heal something in the physical body. So... Uh, as far as the physical body goes, we're going to start there and then we'll move through the higher bodies. So the physical body, being made up of elements, can only be as healthy as the elements that make it up. So this is where we get into food and water and uh, really, really simple topic, but some of the basics are often missed. So starting with food, now there's a lot, there's over a million books on diet, did you know that? If you look up books on diet, there's more than a million. So how is it possible that we can take something as simple as eating and take a million and get a million different books from them. So one of the first things that we do generally is we do exclusions. So we say then these are good, anything on this table is right and anything outside of the table is wrong. So what are we doing there? Immediately we're judging, right? We're making right from wrong. So then we're, from that point, we're actually starting to uh, cut ourselves off from some of the higher bodies because we're living, we're basically moving from an egotistical viewpoint of nature we're judging it so it's not totally bad because if i've got um you know sweets and candies and all that on here and organic produce on here then it's fine to exclude but generally speaking if we take natural organically grown food that's seasonal so whatever nature provides generally we're on the right track for specific health conditions yeah there might be things that we would need to uh, leave out temporarily i'd never really recommend cutting things out long term Reason being is that if we can't handle a certain food, besides quite rare genetic allergies to foods, we're not meant to be intolerant to anything. If we're intolerant, it's because of a deeper level of toxicity that is stopping our body being able to handle a specific type of food, whether that's uh, you know some type of grain or dairy or uh, certain vegetables, you know nightshades, things like that. They're not inherently the wrong foods to eat, but we might have reactions to them. So rather than just take that on face value, tomatoes are bad, I don't eat tomatoes or potatoes or butter or something like that. It's better to ask a question, why do I not tolerate this food? Because generally in almost all cases that I've dealt with over the years, when you break it down, it's come down to a toxic a toxicity in the body. So then you gotta ask, well, how does that work? So for those that don't understand how that works, most of the toxicity that we're dealing with is environmental toxicity and heavy metals. They're the most that, so we, how do we get that? Well, there's a lot of stuff in the environment. There's stuff that's sprayed in there. There's stuff that's sprayed on the food. That ends up in the water supply. That ends up in the soil. That ends up in the food that we 
that we grow. Um, we're vaccinated a lot of us as kids. We were given medications when we were young. Maybe we're still getting that when we're older as well. There's a lot that we're exposed to. Now it doesn't necessarily kill us because the body is very, very resilient. But what happens is there's a number of different mechanisms in the body that like to attract the toxicity. One of those being the brain and the spinal cord. So this is where our neural links work and the brain especially runs on metallic minerals. So metallic minerals are what we usually get through food, that's our nutrition. But what also is very magnetic to that are things like heavy metals. So they'll go straight to the brain and the spinal cord and, and it disrupts and affects our neural pathways which disrupts and affects our ability to digest, to rest properly. It can put our nervous system more into the sympathetic state rather than parasympathetic. If you don't know what that means, it just means fight, flight versus rest and digest, which is where we're meant to be most of the time. So ameliorating base levels of toxicity is more important than cutting out a food and assuming that we just don't tolerate a food. So to, to summarize that, if we are eating organically, naturally and seasonally, then you pretty much can't go wrong with that. If you have some kind of problem with the food, then there's a toxicity, there's a toxic underlying nature that we have to address before we start cutting things out long term because when we do that one second when we do that we're actually stopping our body producing the right number of enzymes and there's a lot that's in a balanced diet like a broad range of foods that if we don't get we're going to um long term start to get deficiencies in that what was your question so there's a massive movement towards veganism these days mm -hmm. and is that kind of what you're talking yeah, well, a lot of diets are restrictive. So that again, that's how we can come up with a million different books is because we have to, one second, we have to uh, start excluding because then from a purely marketing point of view, we have to realize that this world runs on money and it's really easy to start making something sound wrong for something else to sound right. Therefore, I've got the solution. Therefore, you should follow my way of being. And realistically, if money wasn't a thing and I didn't think, well, I could sell 10 million books then I can buy seven houses. If I wasn't thinking like that, I probably wouldn't write the book because it'd be very simple. It's like, if it's organic, it's naturally grown and it's seasonal and I gel with that food, like how many books can you write on that? Yeah. Like one. But then why would you even write the book? Because it's common sense. So you wouldn't even write the book. But then the lure of money and, and or fame and attention and accolades and all that sort of stuff kind of draws us into compartmentalizing and then saying, well, now I'm going to write a book and I'm going to be the one that has the answers. Whereas that's not really how nature works. One second, you had a question? Where does gluten fit into all that? Um, yeah, okay, I'll cover that in a second, yeah. So heavy metals, what are those top like, Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, okay, so um, anything that's tinned, anything that comes out of a can is bad news. Reason being is that uh, not only from the tin itself, but when the manufacturing process is uh, happening, there's a lot of other chemicals that go into actually processing that and sealing the can. And then if you have, the worst tinned food you can probably have is coconut cream. Reason being is that coconut is a very strong solvent and it will, if you use raw coconut cream and you put it onto a tin, you'll actually discolor the tin within a minute. It's, uh, it's that strong of a solvent. Uh, that's raw coconut cream. The coconut cream that goes in tins is generally pasteurized, but at the same time, it's still a strong solvent. So that's a really quick way to get a lot of uh, metallic minerals into the body is through tinned and canned food, especially tuna and things like that as well. Now, uh, one second, I'll just have, handle the rest tomatoes of it. Tomatoes are really acidic. Tomatoes, tomatoes are acidic well. too, yeah. Which is really bad for women and, and, and girls. And yeah, I wouldn't be eating anything. Period. Yeah. Probably and the other thing with the tin tomatoes is that most of the ones they put in tins are, are rotten tomatoes. And then they're actually deodorized and things that you can't tell. It's like you get the fresh produce, then some of it goes off, and then they go, what do we do with that? Let's put it in a tin. And the processing means that it doesn't, you can't really tell that it's off, but they put off tomatoes in the in the tins. Um, so, uh, it's not a heavy metal, but it does go straight to the brain. But you're looking at mercury, cadmium, arsenic, and lead, copper as well. I may as well quickly handle how to handle the metallic minerals then, because that's kind of a concern for most people. Uh, we all have it. Don't think that, oh, no, I've got metals in my body, because we all do. By virtue of being alive in this world, we all have metals in our body doesn't necessarily mean it's going to kill us but it's a good idea to start to help them come out of the body and there are some simple ways to do that so the foods that can help the most uh, if we start with uh, the easiest to to come by is um, berries so berries are really really good at uh, 
chelating, chelating just meaning to bind to and to move, like it magnetizes to particles and it brings it out. Uh, berries are really good. Organic, natural berries, wild berries. So those are things like blueberries, raspberries, boysenberries, blackberries, um, mulberries, perfect, yeah. Especially if you live around, like I live around the northern rivers of New South Wales, mulberry trees grow really well there. So if they're wild and natural, or if you're buying them from a store, if they're organic, so why do you want to buy organic ones? Well, berries do attract metals very easily. So you don't want to get ones that are sprayed with pesticides, fungicides, rodenticides, and, and um, chemical fertilizers, because they are going to absorb a lot of those metals and then you'll take them in. So organic and fresh. Um, fresh versus frozen, I'll just handle that quickly now as well. When we freeze a food, we expand, because fresh, food is mostly water. Like a berry, for example, is 90% water. So when we freeze it, we expand that. And what happens is that if you put, if you have an engine block in a car that's made out of iron, cast iron, like you can't break that with a sledgehammer, but it gets water in it. The water freezes, it'll crack an engine block. So if it can crack an engine block, it's definitely cracking the cell membranes in your food. So freezing a food actually does more damage to it than cooking a food. It does, it denatures the, the elements and the enzymes in the food more so than cooking. So that doesn't mean it's going to kill you again. So one of the things I like to make sure people don't do is go really extreme in the mind. Oh no, frozen berries, they're not good, therefore they're going to kill me. They're not necessarily bad, it's just that they're not optimal. If you want to eat an optimal food, get fresh berries. If the only thing that you can get is frozen berries, they're not going to kill you. Does that make sense? Cool. So yeah, just I try not try to stay away from extremes when I give examples. And then of anything. versus organic frozen berries compared to fresh non-organic berries. Um, well, if, if that's me, I'm going to get fresh non-organic berries, and I'm going to wash them really well. So the way you can get uh, or neutralize any of the toxicity that's on it is to wash it in apple cider vinegar and warm water. Leave that to soak for about five minutes. You could also use something like sun-dried bentonite clay in there as well. That is a binding agent that will attract these metallic minerals and arrest them so that they won't then end up in your body. Quick little thing on, um, on uh, bentonite clay, there was a guy, this was a while ago, he did this bet where he could drink a cup of arsenic. If anyone doesn't know what arsenic is, it'll kill you in a minute, basically. It's highly poisonous. Now, he made this bet to TV networks and he made millions of dollars because he drank a cup of arsenic and then he was fine. He lived. He lived another 40 or something years. Then on his deathbed, he told everybody how he, how he pulled this stunt years and years ago, what he did was he drank a cup of bentonite clay before he took the arsenic. So the, the clay arrested the, the poisons and the toxicity of the arsenic, therefore it didn't kill him. It took him 40 years or something before he told everyone <laughs> his secret, but he made millions of dollars from drinking that. And um, still takes a lot of guts to do that, you know, trust the clay. But, um, but that shows the power of clay. So you can definitely rinse non-organic fresh fruit and vegetables in apple cider vinegar, and you can use uh, some kind of clay. Bentonite clay is really good to use. Where do you okay. get that from? Um, online. There's one called Australian Healing Clay. They all come from different sources. Some are better than others, but only really for specific circumstances. There's not really a bad clay. If it's natural and it's sun-dried, it's okay. If you're going to get clay. Yep. What about genetically modified? Bringing that into your Yeah, I generally stay away from it. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, in a natural, um, non-organic... Yeah. You can't wash that out, can you? You can't wash out genetically modified. Tested. No, it's just it's How just do not. How you recognize genetic? Uh, they're generally labeled, but a lot of the time now they don't even have to label their stuff. So yeah. you want to get it. Here's the thing. It's like most of us in our lives today, we kind of really make choices. And the choices generally have to form some kind of compromise. It's like I want to make way more money. Generally, I'm going to go live in a city and I'm going to compromise some of my access to healthy foods to live in a city and make more money. Or you say, well, look, capitalism, money isn't that important to me. My health is important to me. So I'm going to go and live somewhere like where I live, where it's not so easy to make money, but it's easy to access because you know a lot of the farmers in the area. So it's really, there's no right and wrong. It's just deciding what's most important for you. And that's what's most important for me. So I know where my stuff comes from because I generally either visit the farm where it's grown or I've started planting some of my own trees and that as well so I can get it myself. So that's kind of, you're just going to have to manage your own I guess uh, you're just gonna have to manage what's important to you. But I don't buy anything from a supermarket. Like I was depressed having to go to IGA <laughs> because I assume, because IGA where we are at home, they have some organic stuff and they have uh, glass bottled water. There's no glass in there. I thought I could get some water in glass, but 
it all comes in plastic. So I've either got to go without water for the next five days or I've got to compromise and get some, uh, some, uh, some spring water in a plastic bottle. So hopefully one bottle's gonna do it for me. I'm gonna cover water in a minute. But um, yeah, I'll shelf that and I'll cover water soon. Yeah. yeah going back to the heavy metal toxicity. Yep. Drinking bentonite clay. Bentonite clay you can drink. Clay for yep. a little while, not staying on it permanently, because I've done that yep. for myself, can help really draw all of that stuff out. It can, yeah. Lens, yep. Rather than taking something like toxoplast or whatever. Yeah. So the clay, I'll get to you in a second. The clay, you when you take it internally, it does bind heavily to minerals. So you don't want to have it around mineral rich foods. You don't want to have like a vegetable juice and have clay in it because the clay will arrest the minerals from the food and you won't absorb the food. So if you're going to use it orally, which you definitely can do, then you want to have uh, small amounts, generally a teaspoon. It's generally good to activate the clay as well. That means put it in some water and leave it for a few days, even in the sun. Let it activate again and then uh, take a teaspoon at a time. You can kind of make a paste in of it and then put that into water and stir it through. That's the way you generally is best to take clay. But maybe at the start of the day, leave it an hour, half an hour to an hour before you'll eat something. You could do it at the end of the day again, half an hour away from something. If you're dealing with something really strong, like you definitely know you have something that you want to chelate from the stomach, for example, you can put a lot more clay in. But that's for a, like a medicinal purpose. Same with when you take medicines, herbs and things like that, you don't drink a liter of it at a time. You take it in small doses or higher doses temporarily for a purpose, but then you, you stop after that. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna, yep. Um, yeah, just two follow up questions. So would getting organic canned beans defeat the purpose? Yeah, it defeats okay. the purpose, yeah, yeah. I'll get to the rest of the foods in a second, yeah. Uh, what about seed and light? What can you just turn out? Uh, it's a little less, it's less natural, and there's, there's some elements to it that aren't favorable, but it's not a bad thing to have. It's also a lot more expensive a lot of the time than bentonite clay. Zeolite is really one of those things that got marketed really well. Yeah. Yeah, um, so what would be the difference between having the bentonite clay and the zeolite? Uh, the, I prefer the bentonite clay. Oh, okay. Yeah, it has less um, detrimental properties to it. Oh, the right. zeolite can be a little sharp in some cases. Microscopically, it's, it's actually quite sharp. The bentonite clay is very, very, very soothing. Um, there's, and same with, uh, what's the one you take for parasites? What's the clay? Diatomaceous oh, earth. Oh, Diatomaceous earth can actually slice some of your intestinal lining because it's actually really sharp. It's like glass. Oh. No, it's not a clay, but it's a, it's a shell, yeah, yeah. But people relate it to the same sort of thing, yes. And so I missed some, where did you get this clay? Oh, you can just get it online. If you just search, yeah, just search um, sun-dried natural healing clay, bentonite clay, something like that, you'll find it online. And it's one teaspoon per day? One, uh, yeah, generally per day for maintenance, just for a general cleansing, yeah. For, for food, you'll put a, probably a teaspoon to a tablespoon into say five liters of water with some apple cider vinegar. If you're gonna wash like, uh, if you've just gone out and bought produce, then that's what you would do a soak in. If you, even organic, I'll just quickly cover that because even organic food, if I grow it or if I pick it up from the farm, I don't wash it, there's no point because there's actually beneficial microbiota on the food that we ingest and that helps us. But if I get it from like Santos, which is a local organic store, now that's been in the store and they've used cleaning. They've sprayed cleaning stuff in the store. It also got there by a truck. There's petrochemicals and everything that's just gonna land on the food. Even though it's organic, it's gonna have stuff on the food. So I rinse food that I get from a store if I haven't managed to grow it myself or get it from the farm that I go to. So that's what I do with, um, with foods. Um, yes? This form of um, testing for um, heavy metals. For you? For the body, yeah. Oh, okay, all right, we'll get to that. Uh, first of all, the food's continuing that'll help to uh, eliminate the heavy metals, berries. Now, one step up from berries, if anyone's heard me talk about it before in live streams, is molding the berries. The berries themselves are really potent. Uh, if you allow them to go moldy, they're actually extremely potent. It's like taking something that's a food and turning it into a medicine. It might sound gross to some of us, it sounded gross to me because I grew up in, and I grew up doing science and medicine, so I'm like, molds, bacteria, don't eat that, it's gonna kill you, right? because that's what we're taught. But then you start to learn that pretty much everything you're told is, if you do the opposite, you're gonna be, gonna be better off. So, yeah, so things like molds, if it's a black mold that grows on your wall, because it's been, you, you, that's toxic, that is really bad for you, but if it's the green or the white mold, it's actually beneficial. If you watch what animal, animals do, they'll often bury food and let it to mold before they will eat it. Yeah, dogs will do that all the time. It's really beneficial because most of our body is made up of these microbiota. We're more fungal, parasitic, 
uh, bacterial DNA than we are human DNA. So it pays not to try to kill this stuff off. Same as if we've got like a candida infection, I don't recommend killing that off at all because it's there for a reason and candida happens to feed heavily on heavy metals. So if you've got a candida infection, you've probably got a lot of underlying metals. The candida are doing you a favor because they coat the metals and they start to eat it away slowly, which means that you can process it better than you could without the candida, for example. So, so bentonite clay would be... So bentonite clay is good in that, in that regard. So molding the berries is really beneficial. They don't taste gross either. You basically can't taste it. You can also put it in a smoothie and you're definitely not going to taste it. But they are medicinal. So what that means is that you would eat one molded berry a day. You don't go eating a whole handful. You can, but you might get the runs, a headache and other things and might not be able to work for a couple of days. So you can, and you can get lethargy from it. It's not bad, it's a detox reaction. Okay, so what I recommend doing is not pushing the body into a hard detox at any time. I always recommend going rather slowly with it because the body anyway can only safely detoxify around 3% per year. So that means detoxification is a long-term thing. That's why you can't starve your way to detox. I'm not going to eat for two weeks and I'll detox. It's not going to work. Neither is taking a lot of heavy supplements and neither is going on machines into IV machines because your body simply won't allow it. It'll downregulate other functions in the body in order to protect itself if you try to speed up and force a detoxification. So slowly, that's just the way it works. It's like if you've shoveled manure into a cow shed for 30 years, you're not going to get that in a week. You just can't get it out in a week. It's the same thing with the body. It'll take time. But the good news is that every day you dedicate to doing something like that is you are cleaning out each day. So if you don't want to go through uncomfortable um, symptoms, I would do one molded berry a day. Yep. How would you store them? Just in the fridge. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. You leave them out. So if you haven't molded berries before, they actually mold really easy on their own. But, <laughs> yeah, in the fridge or outside of the fridge. They mold really easily. Um, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. None of them are really wrong. So, but I wouldn't store it in plastic and I wouldn't store it in anything that's, that can be broken down because what the mold does, the reason it's so good at, at breaking down uh, metals in the body is because it is a strong solvent and it'll break down the plastic that you leave it on and then you'll be eating that. So you want to leave it in glass or stainless, something like that. Usually glass is the best. Ceramic. Glass or ceramics, that's what I use, yeah. In a bowl or a, you know, something glassed. So you don't have, if that sounds like, oh, I can't do molded berries, don't worry, you don't have to. Uh, but it is a strong solvent for heavy metals. The, probably the absolute best food is raw coconut cream. It's probably one of the most healing foods I've ever come across. Reason a lot of people don't know about it is that it's hard to, it's really annoyingly hard to make and uh, most people don't make to sell it. Um, it doesn't store that long. It'll go rancid in about two weeks. So to use it, to do it as a business would be really hard. You'd have to have your customers waiting do a, and I've been thinking of doing this. I'm just trying to wait to if I can get a press from overseas, but this is not really happening at the moment. But I still want to do that. But you can get it in places like Europe and America, but they freeze it. Like I said before, freezing a food can reduce its effectiveness. Doesn't mean it has no value though, okay? It just has a lot less value than fresh. But sometimes if I could have frozen, fresh, fruits, different thing but you know what I mean? frozen unpasteurized just frozen raw coconut cream i would have that over not having it but if you can make it yourself it's a lot better so i'll give you guys a recipe of how to make it in case you feel inclined to make it at home there's two ways to make it that well one standard way and one way that i figured out works quite well as well go to get yourself three to five coconuts at a time reason you want to do that is that it's so laborious that you don't want to have to go through the process again the next day to make more cream so you get your coconut you want to get the mature coconuts, the ones with the brown shell. Okay, don't get the drinking coconuts. There's not enough flesh in them. So you break open the coconut and then you get the uh, water out. Or you, you, know, you puncture the three holes and you pour the water out. You can drink that if you want. A lot of the times it's not that great for people, especially women. Women tend to bloat really quickly on, on coconut water. Um, you can drink it, it's not bad for you, but it's just, if you look at the people in the cultures they come from, they generally just turf the water, they don't even drink it themselves, they give it to the Westerners that come over. <laughs> and um, yeah, but it's nice and it's refreshing and it is hydrating, so it's not a bad food. I'm just saying you don't, don't feel you're wasting it if you don't want to drink it all, you can do whatever you want with it. Okay, so once you've emptied the coconut, you want to tap around the outside of the shell to help loosen it a bit, and then you're just gonna like start smashing it any way you want. Then you're gonna scoop out the flesh, yeah, yeah. Scoop all the flesh from it out from inside. Now, what you do with that is it's still got a brown coating on the outside. You've got to get that off as well. That's the annoying part. You've got to get a sharp knife for that. It can take a long time. 
So what you're left with essentially is just white flesh. That's the bottom line. If it's got brown on it, you've done it wrong. If it's still got the outside shell on it, you're not gonna juice that, you're doing it wrong. Just gotta be white flesh. Once you've got that, then you gotta start chopping that into fine pieces. The reason you gotta chop it into fine pieces is that unless you get yourself a commercial press, which is what I wanna get from overseas, you gotta run it through a cold press juicer. Cold press juicers don't like it if you put large amounts of coconut through it. They will handle coconut, but you've gotta chop it up a bit. So good juicers for that are those old champion juicers that's a masticating juicer or just a modern cold press juicer, maybe a twin gear one that is a bit, bit more heavy duty. Then they can, not only can you do your vegetables and that to make vegetable juices, but you can do your, uh, your coconut through it. So when you run the coconut through, you'll get a liquid come out where you would normally get juice come out and then you'll get the desiccated coconut come out the front. You separate the two you'll probably need to run that desiccated coconut back through again because there'll be a lot more cream that didn't come out the first time. So what you've got then in that liquid, that's your coconut cream. It's actually milk and cream. If you wanna separate it, you can put it in the fridge and then it might separate into cream, which will harden and then the, the milk will just be white, um, but you don't need to separate it. It's all basically the fat. Uh, that will store in the fridge for roughly a week to two weeks. If you want to prolong how long it will stay in the fridge, you can put a quarter teaspoon of fresh squeezed lime in it. The lime will help to preserve it for two to three weeks. You don't have to put it in, but it'll help. The other thing that helps to preserve food is raw unheated honey. You could put a little bit of unheated honey in and it'll help preserve it. Can you, can you, grate, the, can you grate the coconut? Yeah, you can grate it, yep. Yeah. So that's the other way to do it is to actually grate it. Some people actually, what they'll do is they'll get a bit on the end of a drill. So instead of, they'll just halve the coconut and then they'll get a drill bit and they'll go in and they'll, they'll put the drill in and it starts to turn it into like, it's like shaving it basically. You can do that as well. The other thing you can do is once you've got it and chopped it into cubes like that is you can put it into a good quality blender and put like, you just have to, if you've got like a good amount of um, coconut, uh, desiccated coconut in there, then you'll fill it with maybe 500 mils of water, just enough to make it all wet. Then you'll run the blender and run it for a couple of minutes. Don't uh, Turn it off after a while because you don't want it to get too hot. You know, the heat is what kills the enzymes. And the fact that it's raw is that it never goes above 36 degrees centigrade. So it's gonna be hard to do that with the water, but you don't want to risk it. So don't run it for too long at a time. Just give it a bit of a rest. Don't let the water heat up. So then what you've got then is you'll get that coconut you have to run it through a nut milk bag, then you'll squeeze it out through the nut milk bag and really squeeze it. You'll even get cream on your hand, you can lick that off or it's the most moisturizing thing you can possibly put on your skin as well. If you've never experienced that, put raw coconut cream on your skin. It's like the most, you'll have the softest skin you've felt basically, better than any commercial moisturizer. So then squeeze it out. What you do with that, that has water in it. So then you've got to put that in a jar and put it in the fridge. What will happen is the cream will solidify on the top. You'll be left with just water underneath. Fat always rises to the surface, like cream on top of milk sits on the top. The fat will always sit on the top. Once it hardens, it's really easy. You just pull it out, you'll scoop it out. And then just whatever you want to do with the water, you could drink it, put it in a smoothie or just tip it out. It doesn't matter. But that's how you're left with the cream. So either you can do that with a blender, you can grate it, you can any way you want to get that flesh down to smaller parts. So you can either juice it or blend it and then squeeze it. If you've juiced it and you've got the desiccated coconut that's come out, save that, put that in a nut milk bag and put it in the fridge. I'll tell you what to do with that soon. But you can use, oh, you could put that in a recipe. You could make uh, bliss balls or whatever, you know, coconut balls out of that. Um, may as well handle it now since I've mentioned it. You can, uh, you can use that for a lot of purposes for skin. Now, one of the best things you can do for detoxification, which I'll get to is the lymphatic bars. I'll cover that soon because I've got to explain it. But you can also put that nut milk bag into a bath with you or into a, a little thing of water for a face wash or a hand wash or a foot wash or whatever. And that'll be really, really good for your skin. So you're basically wasting nothing that's come out of that. You want to keep using because it's still got cream in it. Uh, other foods that are really good for detoxifying are your raw saturated fats. Whether they come from a plant or an animal, doesn't matter. If it's raw and saturated, it's going to be very good for detoxification and especially for helping with heavy metals. Why does it help? Well, the fats not only chelate, but they're very healing and soothing. So when we have metals in the body, they like, they're, it's essentially like if you have uh, something that's hot and you, like, like you're burning tissue, the metals will destroy tissue upon contact. The only tissue that it won't harm in the body is fat. It'll, dis, it'll deteriorate or destroy bone, nerve, muscle, any kind of fiber in the body except for fat. 
So what happens is the body will waste fat in order to protect itself from things like metals. Mercury in particular is the worst. So it takes 50, forget the unit, it's, I think it's 50 fat particles to surround one particle of mercury. So that means that if you've got some mercury floating in the body, your body will waste 50 of its own fat particles in order to arrest that particle of mercury because it is the only tissue that won't be harmed. Now, this is why it's actually a good idea sometimes to have a few, few extra pounds on you because in a world that's quite toxic, in a world where we are taking in more metals, that's actually protecting the body. One of the guys I learned some of the nutrition from, I learned from a lot of people, but one of the guys used to do a lot of the iridology testing. And he had a guy that was really, really overweight, like grossly obese. And when he looked into his eyes, he looked about 30 years younger than his biological age. And that was because the fat that he was carrying was protecting him from all the drugs, the alcohol and the junk foods that he lived on. So even though there were bad fats he was bringing in, the fat in his body was still protecting him from the grossly toxic system that was in his body. Yeah, then it comes out. Yeah, but that's why it's really important. You've got to eat well to do that because you have to allow the foods to help that come out. Otherwise, it will. That can kill you, actually. That can put you into a Herxheimer's reaction. If you're really that toxic and it starts to release and you're eating really bad foods and living a really bad lifestyle, that can kill you. That's why most people die in, uh, sooner than they need to. Yeah, it's oh, toxic overload. So uh, we've got... Um, the fat is really important and it is very soothing. It's soothing for the digestive tract and it's soothing for the nervous system. So the more raw saturated fat you can get into your diet without overdoing it, all I eat is fat, not going that to that degree, but adding foods in that help, raw saturated fat. So what are they? Avocado, raw coconut cream, uh, raw dairy cream if you can get that and butter. That's harder to get, unpasteurized, but it wants to be raw. Stuff like raw eggs and then... Um, what nuts would you recommend if any? Um, small amounts because they're not really saturated they're probably unsaturated fats mostly for nuts um, nuts aren't bad for you but I generally try to minimize those um, or some or, uh, you can use um, olive oil is alright uh, in smaller quantities just not as the majority yeah so uh, you can use coconut oil that's really easy to get but it's not raw doesn't matter what it says on the label it's, it's used they use heat to extract the oil so it's not a raw product uh, and their version of raw is often it's less than some degree, but it's like 80 something degrees, but raw is technically only up to 36 to 40 degrees centigrade. So um, that just so uh, for your own knowledge on how people label and package things. So uh, that covers some of the food. So berries, remember, and raw saturated fats, they're amazing. And then your raw coconut cream. They're extremely good for removing all kinds of toxicity, but specific to um, heavy metals. And also those raw berries that have molded they're specific to vaccines. There was a study done from nutritionists on the yellow fever vaccine where people who, were, uh, who had taken it and had really heavy symptoms, the mold of berries reversed those symptoms. And um, they did a few different controls and double blinds on that. So that's how that was found out. You know, penicillin was found out, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like this trial and error with different things. But penicillin is not a good thing to take as a medicine, by the way. Um, that needs to be broken down. And coconut cream and raw berries will also break down old penicillin deposits in the body wow. um, so detox is a huge thing and that's what I tend to talk most about to people these days because the, the more I see I lost my health when I was 20 to 23 I was uh, an athlete I was running a well, partly running a business a martial arts school I was supposed to go to America to compete over there and I was going to help open a new school over there and I was really really out of balance wasn't really seeing friends anymore. I was friends with everyone at the club and that, but like I spent no time socializing, didn't have a girlfriend, um, didn't, you know, everything was just so focused on only training and competing and doing the business and everything else was just didn't exist. And same, that mindset also related to the way I was eating. I was very extreme in my mindset in everything that I did. As a young male, the ego fully developing around 21, your identity and then your, all the traumas that had come through, I'd never handled it all came into that so that's where the spiritual the emotional and the mental bodies were so badly out of balance that it destroyed the physical body so that's what happened to me and over years and years of trying to recover seeing doctors specialists natural therapists everyone you could name who were all thought that they were experts in their field and then some helped in some ways like i always gleaned something like oh i didn't know that about the body or oh, that's a good piece of bit of advice to apply to just generically so i didn't get no value but none of them helped and so it took a long time to start digging deeper and deeper into finding out why I was sick in the first place. And it ended up being that gross toxicity, well, I just reached an overload. 
And most of it was due to mercury because of the amalgam feelings I had. And then also the vaccines that I'd had because I got another set when I was 19 before I went surfing in Indonesia, which was a bad idea. And then um, just doing dumb stuff like playing around with fluorescent light globes and getting your mate and you, you break them over each other just because that's what you do when you're a young boy, a young man. <laughs> and, uh, and that's got mercury in it. And then all the other forms that mercurochrome when the nurses at school, like your mum rubs that into your open wounds so you're getting mercury straight in your blood. Jeez. And um, yeah, so there are a lot of different... And then, but the thing is, is that mercury will uh, affect two different people completely differently. You've, you've got a different predisposition to how you'll handle it. You have a different load that came from your parents already and you have a different um, constitution in your body that will handle things completely differently what will kill one person won't even be noticed in another until it starts to methylate and it goes into a different pathway then they'll be taken down as well but that happens based on stress as well there generally needs to be a stress event that turns the puts the body into that kind of a system but to answer your question now as to how you know is there a diagnostic you can't do a diagnostic you can't get blood tests for mercury or anything like that why because it doesn't circulate in the bloodstream. It's so highly toxic, it has to be shuttled to areas of the body where it can be arrested and therefore protected. So generally that's glands and organs. The fattiest deposits and the one that, that needs to run on the most metallic minerals is the brain. So unless you're gonna do a biopsy of the brain, you won't find it. You can't test it in your blood. You could sort of test it in urine and hair analysis, but again, it's not really, it's not really giving it. So the way you really tell is simply by your history, what have you been exposed to and your symptoms? Do you have the symptoms of heavy metal toxicity? And and, you, and then your history. Because not always is it gonna be mercury, yeah? You can just assume that everyone does have heavy metal. Oh yeah, yeah, you can. Here's the thing though, uh, <laughs> I don't recommend going on to really definitive detox protocols unless you're actually sick. Like I was at the stage where it was like, well, I'd rather be dead. So I'm gonna go on to a, a protocol because that's going to get me to health. But if you're functioning normally, if you're like, if you can live it, we're all toxic, right? Like no one's really out of that boat. So if you can live a good daily life, you can work, you can play, you can make love to your partner, you can be creative, you can do extracurricular activities, sports and whatever. Just take it as like a long-term slow thing. Don't go too fast into it because you can go through that stage where you're here and then you make yourself down here somewhere because you're trying to push the body too hard through a detox you don't really need to go through. But if you're already down here and you kind of got nothing to lose, you're not, you're not able to live a normal life, you're not able to hold down a regular kind of a job, you're not able to make love regularly to your partner or to go out and play sport a few times a week or engage in extracurricular activities, then, then go for it because you're not, you're not living a normal life. Not even an optimal life, but not, a, not even a normal life. That's when I say go into these protocols that are more rigorous and heavy duty. Yeah, until then, I don't, I don't recommend it. Are there certain therapies that would work for you to go alongside that, like something like acupuncture? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So the thing with the thing with what you would call complementary modalities is that if you are getting acupuncture, for example, because you have headaches, and then you walk out of the clinic and you start head banging to heavy metal music or playing gridiron and smashing your head, in, you, you, you're not gonna. That therapy is not gonna do anything. So it's only going to support what you're already doing. You have to be doing everything in that direction for the complementary modalities to support that because that's what they do. Acupuncture is really powerful, by the way. Um, but if you are living a lifestyle that's completely at odds with what that therapy is offering, then you're not going to get a lot out of it. But it can support things like detox protocols. So we'll handle more of detox in the questions at the end if we want to go into that. But I'm going to go to the other way you can start to detoxify, which is using heat and lymphatic bars, and then we're gonna move on to the rest of the subject matter. Again, anything you still want covered, I'm gonna leave time for at the end. So uh, the lymphatic bars is when we use heat, water at 40 degrees centigrade. Usually it's between 39 and 41 degrees centigrade, but I say 40 as a, as a middle ground. Why 40 degrees? Well, first of all, being in water is different to being in a sauna. You can be in a sauna at 80 degrees, but you've got sweat wicking away the heat and air around you wicking away the heat. It doesn't necessarily heat your core temperature up to the desired amount. What happens when we reach fever temperature is that for the same reason we get a fever, which is the, one of the reasons you never wanna let hospital staff or anyone give you anything that brings fever down because fever is regenerative. Your cells regenerate thousands of times faster at fever temperature. It's also anti-inflammatory and gives a lot of other benefits. Nature does not get it wrong. Okay, we don't have a fever mechanism for no reason. 
okay? It's there for a reason. We can induce that with 40 degree water. It takes a little bit of time, but sitting in a constant temperature, which means you'll need to keep running more hot water in the bath to keep it at that temperature, use a digital thermometer. Once it drops below 39, add more hot water. So what we get at that temperature is a very regenerative state. It also cleans the lymphatic system. The reason it does that is that we have a lot of stored residues in the lymphatic system that either are plastics or replicate plastics. One of the greatest sources of that is too many polyunsaturated fats that come into the body. Now, ruminants like cows, they have a body temperature of around 40 degrees. They only eat grass. The fats that are in the grass can liquefy at that temperature. Our bodies at best run at 37. Most people in society, because I've measured it, are hypometabolic because of our lifestyles and our toxicity. We run at 36.3 down to 36.5 on average. That's really low. That's because the body's metabolism is not firing at where it's meant to be. That's gonna cause hormonal and metabolic issues and a lot of other factors as well. So that means that at that temperature, those polyunsaturated fats are solid. They will not liquefy. So they store in the body and they actually clog the lymphatic system. It takes 45 minutes in a bath of 45 degree, at 40 degrees in order to liquefy that fat and have it start to move through the body. So you can feel quite crappy after that bath. You should keep the heat on you and go for a walk to help it help walk it off. It's also very intense. So the maximum number of baths you would do a week as a lymphatic bath is two. You would leave three days in between each bath. It takes some time to recover. So, oh, one second, I'll just finish the bath and I'll get to you. So when you do the temperatures, I would recommend starting at 39 and go for half an hour, 45 minutes. Remembering it takes 45 minutes minimum, so usually 60 minutes to 90 minutes if you're doing it properly, but then you don't wanna go, well, that's what I'm supposed to do, so I'm gonna do it now, because if your body doesn't handle it, you'll go backwards. So you, take in, you keep in mind what does the therapeutic action, but realize that like Olympic weightlifting or you know, like becoming a great pianist or something, it's like you work up to it. You don't just jump straight into the hot seat. So with the bars, do start slow because you'll get to where you want to go faster by taking it slow, okay? Um, you don't have to make that full time straight away. You don't have to keep the heat straight away. Too hot, it's, it's not good either. You can overheat certain things in the body. You don't want to go more than 42 degrees, 42 and a half. Uh, short term, you can if you want to do a really hot bath. One quick note on that is in some cancer clinics, they do as hot as somebody can stand and they submerge them. And they start, because it's really uncomfortable, and they'll start thrashing around trying to get out and they'll actually physically hold them in the bath. They keep them held down until they actually, they're about to pass out and then they'll pull them out because there are therapeutic actions for that as well. Don't generally recommend that, but it's something you can do with heat. I'll get to you. Um, young man, you had a question? Uh, about how long the bath is going to go for the answer. Yeah, okay, yeah. So 45 minutes is minimum. You want to aim for an hour to 90 minutes. It's really hard to do. You can leave your hands and your legs out. It's just important to keep all your glands and organs underwater. So neck to gonads, keep that underwater. Um, sip water as you need to. You might even want to do, see when I used to do a lot of saunering uh, when I was competing because you'd have to drop weight and stuff, there was this jockey that was always in the sauna that I'd go to and he'd be in there for like two hours and be like, man, like he didn't leave. And what he'd do is he had a, uh, a, a bowl of ice water that he'd keep at the bottom of the sauna and he'd continually keep bending over with a towel and he'd be breathing in the um, cool air from the, from the iced water. And then what he'd also do is wet his wrists obviously and then he'd He'd put the uh, like a hand towel in there and just put the damp, put the cold hand towel in his head because if you cool the head, that's going to work. One of the reasons you'll get too uncomfortable is the brain heats up, and also if you're methylating mercury and things like that, the brain gets too hot. You're in like uh, can't function. So you want to keep the brain cool as much as possible. And so you had the question first, did you? No. no. Um, what about going from hot to cold? Oh yeah, hot cold therapy is really good if you haven't done that. Do, once you get really, really hot, go and do a one to three minute cold shower or ice bath or something like that. You can do that hot, cold, hot, cold. It just flushes the body really strongly. It's um, Again, that's intense. Because I'm kind of giving advice, I'm gonna have to tell you, you gotta do it really safely. You gotta have somebody else around. If you pass out and you're on your own, that's not good. So just be sensible with that sort of stuff. Uh, yep. Would you put um, something in the bath in the heat? Like yeah, yeah, you can put Epsom salts. And then there's another one, um, you can put clay in there. Soda, isn't that really good to get things out of the lymphatics? Like uh, it can be, yeah. Well, it softens the skin a lot, yeah. But you can put the bentonite clay in the bath as well. It's really absorptive. Um, yeah, so the bars are a really good option. Uh, saunas, anything sweating. Like the skin is the largest organ in the body. What we don't process through the kidneys and the lungs and the bowel and things will generally process through the skin. So it is a good idea to sweat. 
Uh, even in summer, I'll do bars, I'll do saunas. It's good to do. Um, yeah, you had a question? If you're overheat and you're doing a heat deck pop, yep. like probably in the heartbeat, is that a sign of too much mental illness? Uh, is it a natural thing? It is natural, but you definitely won't handle it when you've got metals in the brain. Like you'll really, really not handle it well when there's metals. But way more so than you would. Normally you can handle the heat pretty well. But if you heat up, your brain heats up and you're really put off, that's generally a good sign there's metals in the brain that are circulating and or trying to get out. And, and yeah. dementia sucks. Um... Oh, that, that's a lot of different things. Dementias, yeah. Um, metals are a cause, but um, you've got a lot, of, a lot of other causes for that as well. Generally, a, a lack of fat in the brain is something too. And you know what is a lack of E. coli in the bowel? Because the E. coli is what feeds the brain and the nervous system. And if you have a lack of E. coli from too many medications or not enough uh, food that's natural and actually builds the, the um, bacterial system in the body, that can lead to things like dementia and degenerative brain disorders. Is sugar a factor? Yeah, sugar's a factor too, yeah. yeah. Um, keep that in mind, actually. When anybody tells you salmonella will kill you or E. coli, that's so necessary for the body. Not only are they all on our eyelids, fingernails all of the time, but that's actually our primary method of defense. So anytime you're sanitizing your hands or whatever, you're taking away yeah. your primary. I've been um, about that. Yeah, you're taking away your primary defense mechanism, which is the natural <laughs> biota that surrounds the body. The E. coli in the body, like I said, it's it's vital. If you don't have enough, your brain and nervous system won't function well. And then if you really don't have enough, it won't function at all. So it's really important to keep that up with things like raw foods and foods that have naturally high. Um, biota in them you know fermented, food. fermented foods yeah anything that's high in natural natural probiotics yep uh depends what they had it from but well it depends on why you have a heart attack and some people have them quite young in life some people have multiple heart attacks and then you know it's it really depends generally it's from the blood pressure being too high but there's a lot of factors that can go into it so what i'd suggest is cutting down on things like alcohol smoking like anything that's obviously bad for the body and then yeah and then the raw saturated fat again for that is really good reason being it's protective and it's soothing so people say that fat you got to cut down cholesterol but cholesterol by itself isn't bad cholesterol is what builds hormones in the body you need it if you're lowering cholesterol you're in a bad place but for things like a heart attack could be caused for example by hardened arteries and plaque in the arteries now that's because um, that's from a lifestyle. That's from bad lifestyle and bad food choices. Again, those unsaturated or uh, trans fatty acids, they don't break down well in the body. They will block and clog arteries. How do you get that out? Solvents. So the solvents that are strong are your raw foods, raw vegetable juices, your raw coconut cream, and particularly lime. Raw lime and lemon juice, they're really good for solvents for breaking down old plaque in the body. So that can help keep things like arteries clean. And then from an energetic perspective, making sure that the heart is strong. There's joy in the life and there's love in the life. If that's not there, the heart, the heart energy can be constricted. So when we think of things like, that's where I was getting at, you know, with the, the four bodies, if we feel constricted or we're holding on to something, the body will do this. It will lock down on something. So for example, dealing with weight loss clients uh, in the past, sometimes people can be doing everything right. Like they can have, they can be eating really, really clean, organic, fresh foods. They can be exercising three or four times a week. They can be getting enough sleep. They can be doing everything right. They're holding on to a lot of weight. Why? It's just not shifting. And when you look into their history, there's evidence, for example, of sexual trauma, like something that's been very traumatic sexually. So then what happens is unconsciously, the mind can, dis can just decide or the unconscious can decide that they're always a threat to pred or at uh, the threat of predators, right? So then if the body becomes larger like that, maybe it won't be as appealing to predators. So consciously, they're like, why would I want weight? But unconsciously, the unconscious is way more powerful than the conscious mind. Then it does this and it's constricting and it doesn't matter what you do with your food and lifestyle, the body isn't going to let go of the weight. So then you handle the trauma and let go and the body does this, it lets go. And so when it does that metaphysical letting go, it physically lets go of the weight too. And without changing diet, exercise and lifestyle, they'll drop 30 or 40 pounds in about two months. So remember, we're always told calories put on weight and you lose weight if you, if you drop calories. Well, there's a lot more to it than that. And that just shows the metaphysical aspect of the body of the holding on. And it happens with the heart too. Like, I don't know if anybody knows the comedian Bill Burr. 
He's an American comedian. He's really funny. He's really funny because he's really, he doesn't hold back. He's super blunt and he's super uh, offensive to some people. But he has this bit where he talks about how guys can't admit that like a puppy's cute or wants to hug a baby and you have to, you have to like, you have to push it down. That's why guys will drop dead at 50. It's from like 50 years of just like not being able to admit something's cute or like, you know, have feelings kind of thing. It's kind of, it's funny because that's a true representation of a lot of, a lot of modern men. And that's what can cause a heart attack to it. It's a brittleness. It's a lack of suppleness and a lack of softness in the mind and the body, which can then relate to something like a heart attack. So it's not always just diet. It's the way that we relate to ourselves and the world around us. Uh, so I may as well get to some of the... Um, I've drawn this. It's, uh, just so you can have a quick look. Yeah, this triangular, triangular looking thing. That's an iceberg. Just so you know. So the iceberg, most people know what the uh, theory of an iceberg is and the, the majority of the, of the iceberg is underwater. Now, this, what this represents is the unconscious and the conscious. The conscious is the things that we're aware of and we can generally see or, or rationalize or whatever. The unconscious being the vast majority of the iceberg that actually determines the path of the iceberg and the nature of the iceberg. Now, this line, the water line, in my experience, is the bridge between... This can also be looked at as the metaphysical and the physical. So again, the physical body doesn't have as much bearing on our health or the state of the physical body as the metaphysical, you know, as that mental, emotional, and spiritual side. This line here, the water line, is actually the hormones. The hormones, to me, seem to be the chemical messenger between the metaphysical and the physical. So this is why when we have hormonal issues, which affect everything, the hormones determine how the body um, processes food, how it creates enzymes, how it creates um, pretty much everything in the body. The processes of hormones are extremely complex, but it's so important to how we feel and how we operate as a human being. So that being the bridge between the metaphysical and the physical can be a real, a really good like diagnostic tool as to how are my hormones functioning, and then that can be a representative of how we are operating between the physical and the metaphysical, because that, that gap between the two is is uh, really only bound by that nature. And so when we're dealing with, um, it's not even that we're dealing with the health issues per se, but well, like I said at the start, if we are a soul having a physical body, then the first tenet of that spirituality or one of the first precepts must be to learn how to have that body. And I see a lot of people that enter into the, the spiritual realm and they want to ascend to the highest level possible, but they seem to have missed some of these fundamental building blocks, which if it's part of the journey, is something that should be handled early. Now, just to give a bit of a clarification there, you see some people that are like spiritual gurus and they're either really, really big or they're really, really frail. Either way, you would say they must be missing that first element because the physical body, the body doesn't lie. It, must, it doesn't look like it's being respected. But the other side of that coin is that some people that develop really strong psychic abilities or really strong, uh, just a strong spiritual attributes comes from having some kind of uh, injury, illness, or um, something that the body is not functioning well, and so there's a bit of a there's a bit of give and take in that as well. Okay, just so that you know, like some people might be going through things where they've been in a certain state for a long time, and it's not because they're disrespecting the body. They are watching what they eat. They are conscious of what they're eating and their lifestyle and everything else, but things don't change. So it's just an opportunity. Everything that we experience, if it's pain or misfortune or discomfort, is a teacher. So sometimes what we're experiencing through the physical self is really just a teacher. It's teaching us a bit more about where we are in our journey and where we can actually go because all of us are on a journey where there's no end to. So a lot of these things, as I say, just teachers. So uh, who's got the time, by the way, because I want to make sure that you guys get everything you need. 12.53. All right, cool. Uh, I'll cover just a couple more quick things and then we'll do questions. So... The food and the water, well, actually, actually got to cover water because I said I would. So did anyone see the live stream that I did on water? If anyone's seen, yeah? Yeah, of water, okay. Uh, I'll cover it quickly because most people, this is a really confusing topic for a lot of people. And I'll cover how I got to it. So I was one of those people that drank three to five liters of water a day, partly because I was an athlete and I was sweating a lot, but partly because it's just what I did. It's a healthy thing to do. You got to drink three liters of water a day at least. And if you want to detox or if you want to stay slim or if you want to be healthy, you drink a lot of water. What also happened was that I was cold a lot of the time. I'd get up twice in the night to pee. I couldn't watch a movie because if it went for longer than an hour and a half, I'd have to pee. And um, 
a lot of other things like degenerative things started happening. It got to the stage because I was always interested in the natural way of things and I started looking at tribes, especially as I was studying diet and nutrition. And like, why are these people in exemplary health and what do they do? What's different between them and us? And um, carrying around three to five liters of water a day was annoying. It was really annoying. And I'm, I'm like, there's no way that tribes people are carrying around like water bottles. Like, how are they surviving? Or what are they doing for water? So I started looking into what they're doing. Turns out they don't actually drink a lot of water. And so then you go, but why are they in exemplary health? Well, it must be because they're not training as much as me. It's not because of this. It's like, no, no, it's just this topsy-turvy world where we're told something that's not really true and actually can be degenerative. So water, if you look up universal solvents, water is the number one universal solvent. That means that water breaks down anything that it goes into or it touches. So water, when it goes into the soil, breaks down rock. The rock becomes minerals, it becomes food for the soil. That becomes food for the plants and the animals and everything else. Water is a solvent. If we drink too much water, we're actually breaking down parts of our body and it dries the body out. The more water you drink, the thirstier you can become because it's drying the body out. What lubricates and hydrates the body is actually fat. That's why when you look at most of the tribes that are the healthiest and most successful, the majority of their food is fat. Also, when you're eating majority raw foods, that's majority water. Not only is it majority water, but it's 100% bioavailable. When water is in food, it has an ionic charge. It's bound by ions, it's bound by minerals, enzymes, and everything else that makes it bioavailable. When you drink water by itself, it does not represent a bioavailable liquid form. Maybe 5 to 15% will end up in the body, in the cells, inside of the cells. That's hydration. The rest of it is wasted. The rest of it, especially if you drink too much and too quickly, dumps straight to the kidneys and flushes straight out. It does that, the body does that in order to thicken the blood to maintain homeostasis and heat. That's a stress on the body, you're stressing the kidneys. In Chinese medicine, they say that too, don't drink too much water or don't drink cold water especially. It's bad for the kidney energy, it's stress. So drinking too much water is really not a good thing. Uh, that doesn't mean drink no water, because you might die, but it does mean that if you can get more of it from food or at least structure the water by adding a food to it, how can you do that? For me, I squeeze fresh lemon in it. It puts an ionic charge in the water and makes it more bioavailable. But most of my food, because I eat all my food raw, even animal foods, that's really high in water, and so that's really hydrating. And I don't have a high need for water. Yep. What about just put a bit of mineralized salt? Yeah, yeah, some mineralized salt, the same sort of thing. It just helps to make it more available. But generally speaking, most people drink too much water. I'm not trying to tell you, I'm not going to give you advice to cut down on it, but I'm just going to tell you that if you need to pee more than every four hours, you're probably overhydrated. If you have to get up in the night ever to urinate, you're drinking too much water. That's not normal to get up in the night to urinate. Uh, if, you've, if you can't sit in a room like this without putting three jackets on, like I've been to yoga conferences and they're all sitting around in blankets in 25 degree heat and it's like, dude, you're drinking, you're not eating enough food and you're drinking too much water. It's, you're, not, you're not supposed to be cold in, in that kind of environment. And then also, um, there's other things that go along with it. Irritability, uh, nervous system function that can all be affected by drinking too much water. Um, yeah, you had a question? So how much would you recommend? Oh, there's no recommend. There's no, yeah. So generally, if I'm sweating a lot, like if I, I'll go through 750 mils in a day of water. Um, if some days I drink no water, if I'm not highly active and sweating, I won't drink any water. It'll all come from vegetable juices, which is 96% water, raw eggs, which is 96% oh, water, um, you know, uh, dairy that I eat, and like milk, things like that. I make yogurts from it. It's a natural probiotic. That's all mostly water. So you'll get it from raw foods, but if you're eating mostly cooked food and things, you are gonna need to, more water to go with it. When you cook food and you see the steam coming off, that's water leaving it. And it's less bioavailable as well. So yeah, it doesn't mean cut out water. It just means go by thirst. Like people say, if you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. But it's like, real, but that's, made, that's, a, that's your body, it's made by nature. Like how can you just say that nature just made mistakes? Oh, I got that wrong. It got it so wrong that if you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. It's not really true. It's like saying, if you don't need to poo yet, you should go and force one out because you're already constipated. It's like, it doesn't make any sense. So you should just drink to thirst. And when you do drink, the most important thing is just to sip it. So you could take a one liter bottle of water and if you just go glug, 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 you probably drink way more than you need. If you sip that rather slowly, you'll probably go through this much and you go, I don't need any more. But if you don't, you glug it, you'll drink this much. Then that stresses the body. It has to flush through the kidneys. You lose minerals and it's a stress on the body. Um, yes? Um, I, I had a lot of cognitive dissonance when I listened to you say that because I was a three plus liter a day yeah. now, but I have dropped back and I have to say it probably took about two to three weeks for my body to adjust, but mm -hmm. it has helped. 
I don't have any of my large bowel. Mm -hmm. And that's where a lot of your water's absorbed. Yeah. So would you say that's still sticking to that around, because I'm, I'm eating a lot more raw food as mm -hmm. well, that that's enough? I actually I feel better within myself. Yeah. I had a lot of people tell me that. They dropped the amount of water they were drinking and they felt way better. Um, but yeah, there's, oh, it's always on a case-by-case -case basis. But generally, like I say, if, you, if you're peeing the, and it's like just lightly colored, then you're hydrated enough. If you're peeing and it's crystal clear, you're overhydrated. If you're peeing and it's like really dark urine or it glows in the dark somehow, it's like then you definitely need more water. You know, it's the, the, your body has signs. You can do the pinch test. It's not definitive, but the pinch test is just pinch the skin on the back of your hand and let it go. If it springs back instantly, unless you're like 95 years old, but if it springs back like that, you're hydrated. If it takes a long time to come back, you need more water. Uh, little things like that. Um, yeah, the aircon, the, the aircon will dry your skin. Yeah, for sure. And it'll give you a dry mouth. Yeah? Are we all being told different things like they're eating and drinking? Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you generally, if it's a liquid, unless it's a digestive liquid, like it's got raw honey in it, which is the highest natural source of enzymes you can get, by the way, if you get unheated honey, um, and lemon in it, for example, to bring up digestive or apple cider vinegar, ginger, something like that, then I wouldn't be drinking water more than uh, like half an hour before food and half an hour to an hour afterwards. It does dilute your stomach acid. and um, But it's really, it is really a case of don't try not to go by rules. Like really just let nature guide things because most of the things we're taught is are wrong it's like the food pyramid and then the this and all of it's wrong so it won't won't help yeah i've had bariatric surgery so i can't drink water i used to drink a lot of water mm -hmm. i need to change the surface tension of it because you're adding the honey and the apple cider vinegar to the surface tension and it's not it's not going to be good yeah it does yeah yeah it's also like the softness or the hardness of the water or the bioavailability but yeah. bio bioavailability but when i what gives me most of my water and minerals is that I juice vegetables. So I juice mostly green vegetables and it's going to be too, I don't have enough time to go too much into this, but just so you know, the cellulose in vegetables is not digestible to the body. And it has a lot of, um, it has a lot of anti-nutrients, which is just to protect the plant from predators. So when you want to get most of the nutrients from a plant, if you can have it raw, that's why you have to cook vegetables most of the time. If you're going to have it raw, it's best to juice them and you get all the nutrients out of it and the enzymes. And if you drink like a good cup of juice, that's a lot of water and that's all bioavailable. That's all going to get into the body. So generally vegetable juices, when you've got any, if you had surgeries and you're missing part of your stomach or your digestive system or you can't handle normal water, juicing vegetables is probably the best thing. Fruits, no, because it's too high in sugar and too acidic to have. Um, doesn't mean not at all, but I mean, don't have a huge glass of fruit juice, but vegetable juice, yes. Yeah, cold pressing, yeah. No, no, because it just heats it up too much, you know. Um, cold pressed juices, like, people think that getting healthy can take a lot of money, but mine costs like $65 on Gumtree, cold pressed juicer. Because people buy them, they're like, I'm going to get healthy yeah, and yeah, do it. Yeah, yeah. And they never use it, and they sell it off really cheap. Uh, juices are plentiful. Cold pressed juices on Gumtree and Facebook Marketplace are really plentiful. What's your thoughts on coffee? Um, it's At no stage is it not an irritant to the body and the nervous system. Doesn't mean you can't have it. I'll tell you, okay, here's a good thing for just for coffee, for chocolate, for anything, right? Is it's bad for the body. Just technically it's bad for the body because it's an irritant to the nervous system and it's an irritant to a lot of things. There's anti-nutrients in it and all that sort of stuff. That's from the, but here's the thing. If it brings you a lot of joy, the joy that the food can give you can produce more good chemicals in the body than the food possibly can. So it outweighs the bad, the badness of the food. So when we get too caught up in this is good and this is bad and we judge, we come too much from that judgment, criticizing uh, point of view, that's detrimental to the body. To the point where I could eat like, I don't know, a pineapple, which is really good for me, or coconut cream. But if I'm judging it so hard, this is so bad for me, it's so bad for the coconut fairies and whatever else. And then I drink a food that is highly beneficial, but my mind is turning it almost into a poison because of how heavy I am in my emotions and my, my thinking, criti criticizing and judgmental state. So if you really enjoy coffee and you're not having obvious adverse reactions to it, like you're not getting all jittery or having heart palpitations or you know your, your nervous system is always wired and you're sleeping all right, you know if, if your health is generally all right, don't worry about it. If it brings you joy, then it's okay. So coffee per se, it's not good. You can make it better by having a saturated fat and a sugar with it of some kind. It helps them metabolize the caffeine better.
But at the same time, if it brings you joy, I say go for it. Because yeah, same with any food, anything that you that can bring you joy. I'll just quickly handle the last few things, and we'll do a few more questions. Uh, the last part that I wanted to handle with regards to the basics of health is creativity. Creativity, we are essentially made from, we're created from a pure f- force or source of creativity. It only knows how to create. The source of creativity that put us here only knows how to create. It doesn't know things like can't, won't, shouldn't, will suck if I do it, or it doesn't know limitations. So what happens is that when we become self-aware we start becoming aware of judgment and criticism so we might be doing something no don't do that you're being too noisy we'll do some coloring and that sucks you're doing it wrong don't go outside the lines don't do that it's the wrong time of day you're not supposed to be doing that clean your room or at school no you see plus for that one you're not real good at art don't bother or create anything creative right so we start to learn these sorts of things so then when we go and start to want to do a project ourselves we go oh I don't know, Sally's better than me at that, so I probably won't do it, there's no point. Or I'm shit at that, so I'm not going to bother. Or I can't. Or I probably shouldn't because I should be doing something else. The thinking, criticizing, and judging mind kicks in, and then it mutes that creativity. So that source of creativity that only knows how to create and knows no bounds, we start to put limitations on. It's like an endless flow of water and we plug it. So it's really important in our adult lives that we start to unplug that. The creativity, if we mute that, we're, we're muting our soul expression into the world. Um, and one of the highest sources of creativity is sexual energy. And a lot of people, while you might not think that you're consciously suppressed in certain ways, most of us are unconsciously repressed because of the world that we've grown up in. To the point, the highest number of cases of people with cancer of the sex organs, so cervical, uterine, testicular cancer, are Catholics. So why? Well, it's, we know that people who grow up in a Catholic system have a very specific set of beliefs about sensuality, sexuality, what's right and wrong, and so on and so forth. And it's not hard to make the bridge between the repression of sexuality and biological natural thoughts and compulsions and repressing those to turn into tumors and cancers of the same area. So this is what we can do with a lot of areas of our lives when we mute or we suppress creativity. So it's really important if we think that we won't be good at something or we shouldn't or we can't, we should be doing it anyway. Creativity is such a big part of a healing process and not only healing process, but just keeping the body running vibrantly and healthily. And part of that is having a purpose and a dream. So a lot of what I learned, I learned from Paul Cech. If you don't know who he is, he's an American guy. He's probably the number one holistic health practitioner uh, on earth as far as what he's able to do for people. Check is spelled C-H-E-K. If you want to check him out on YouTube, he's got a book called How to Eat, Move and Be Healthy. That's probably the best book you can get as far as the million books that are available. Get Paul Check's How to Eat, Move and Be Healthy. You don't really need any others after that. So uh, what he teaches and what I learned from him is when you're dealing with a client, the first thing you want to know is what's their dream. If they don't have a dream in life, it's very unlikely they're going to reach their goal or their objective because there's no reason to have it. A lot of people who I've dealt with, they say, well, my dream is to be healthy. And I'll say, but what do you want to do without health? What is it that that's going to bring? What are you going to put into the world? Because if you don't know what you're going to do with it, it's highly unlikely that you'll get it. You'll sabotage because what we've got now we've created and we're where we've created and where we're meant to be, what we've asked for. And if we don't change that, if we don't have a reason not to have it, we'll continue to have much of the same. And a lot of that is done through self-sabotage. So it's so important to have a dream. Now, that might sound really off-putting for people because they're like, well, I don't know what my dream is. I don't want to have to come up with that. Like, what if it's wrong? Or what if, I, what if it's too low? What if it's too high? What if I don't get it right? What if I change my mind in a week? So all these things stop us from determining what our dream is. And it doesn't matter if we're 17 years old or 87 years old. It doesn't make any difference. It's always the same. It's, most people have seen when somebody retires, they could be really fit and healthy and within a year, they're, with it and they're probably dead. A lot of people die within a few short years of retirement, not because of their age, but because they stopped having something really definitive to live for, okay? So it's so important to have that and it doesn't matter if it changes every week, it really doesn't, but it's like a guiding star. It's like, why am I getting up in the morning? What makes me resonate? Like, what is it that I'm doing? What? So what will be guideposts to help me know the opportunities and the steps that I'm taking in life that can help me to get where I want to go because if we don't choose where we're going to go we're probably going to go where somebody else is choosing us to go 
and that might be happening on a really unconscious deep level but it'll happen like that we have to take control of our own lives well this talk i'm going to do on tuesday is about law and um not not really law but commerce and how we can kind of take our own power for ourselves which is really important and health and law go really hand in hand if we don't take responsibility for our own health and what we're expressing into the world somebody else is going to do it for us and it generally won't be to our benefit so relying too much on doctors or what the government says or what anybody else says it can be detrimental it's not a wrong thing to do that's somebody's life lesson that's their purpose sometimes to go a whole life doing that but for people that are guessing that are here at this event you know we want to take more responsibility for ourselves and that doesn't have to be um, something that's oh no that sounds too hard or that's going to be difficult I don't know where to start because a lot of it is just listening to our internal guidance and sometimes that might put us somewhere where we don't want to be but then we know what that signal meant so we learn from that we never really can get it wrong as long as we're willing to continually grow and keep an open mind and an open heart two things will generally get to where we want to go but we, we need to know where we want to go in the first place so having a dream if that's too much to ask then just think of what your nightmare is what is it that you're not willing to compromise on anymore? What's like, what for you is like, I'm not willing to take that. Or I'm not going to put up with that. And so when we can determine that, we can just start going the opposite direction. We at least know what our core values are. We're starting to determine those based on what we really don't want to have in life, what we will not accept. So then we can start going in the opposite direction and then we'll find the things that become our dream. And it doesn't have to be grand. Like I want to go and build 100 hospitals in Africa and India. It's like that's a that's kind of like a really egotistical dream in some ways but a lot of people think it has to be grand but it doesn't it could be as simple as making like ceramic cups for people in your community because that is your expression of joy and when people get a cup made by you know you it changes their life it's like a gift that you're offering you know so the dream doesn't have to be grand it just has to be something that gives you a feeling of something that you're here for that's unique we might all make cups for example right and then seven billion people make cups in the world but you, there's something unique about you that is going to go into what you create that somebody else doesn't do so then some people are going to gravitate more towards what you make than what i make and what anybody else makes so again it's really important in the world that we live in we are kind of homogenized a lot and we can feel that we don't have as much unique value but that's it's really not the case so we just need to keep an eye on that as well and um, work towards something that is going to bring us life. Sometimes it means getting away from things like what we're supposed to do, you know, like chasing the things we're supposed to chase because that doesn't often bring joy. I've dealt with a lot of people that are really, really wealthy and most of them are really, really unhappy. Almost all of them, you know. So it's got to be something that we want to express. What is it that we're expressing from the internal to the external? So, um, Pardon? Uh, mostly, yeah, it changed a lot since the whole Corona thing, yeah. But now, now I've changed and adapted, and that's what I'm doing now. So we've got to we've got to wrap up because we've got to let the next presentation. How when do they need to come in? Who's stuck? Five minutes. Yeah, cool. Yeah, cool. All right. So we'll just handle a few more questions. Um, okay, <laughs> started. <laughs> Oh, black salve, yeah, it's, um, it doesn't necessarily move the toxicity from the body. It's more for, uh, well, technically it does. But that's what most, if anyone doesn't know what black salve is, mostly it's used as a topical and mostly it's used for things like skin cancers and when people have uh, like lumps in their breasts, for example, a lot of women have used it to, it draws it out through the skin. It's really blacklisted product. You're not really supposed to get it or have it, which is generally a good sign that it does something. Right. Yeah, so if you can get it, it's a good thing to use. I don't know many people that use it internally. Yeah, externally it's usually the best thing. Yeah, I'm it does. Yep. Okay. Maybe. Yeah, I'm not a. I don't know heaps about it. I only know. I only know that it's good. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure if 
this is a thing about these kinds of conferences, guys, as well. Like a lot of us in this room have a collective experience and knowledge base that's really good. And if you hear somebody bring something up and you might have an answer, you know, feel free to just go up and introduce yourselves after. Anytime you hear somebody say something, or even if you, you don't agree with something, it's good to come and have a conversation with them about your experiences and share. So if anybody does have extra information about anything that somebody asks about, then definitely uh, see each other, yeah? Uh, first off, um, thanks for a great workshop. You're welcome. That's great. Um, Sigmund, just um, ask about the gluten thing again. Oh, yeah, gluten. Sorry, I didn't come to that. Okay, so gluten in its natural organic form isn't necessarily bad for the body. Gluten in its genetically modified form is definitely not recognizable by the body. But gluten does have some positive uh, attributes. For example, it combined with um, it combined with the gluten in the starches combined with uh, the residues that are created from excess hormone production help to take those out of the body. So gluten can have positive effects. It's not all negative. And um, generally speaking, it's not good to overdo it, but it's not per se in and of itself a negative thing unless it's genetically modified. So if it's an ancient grain, it's natural organic, then gluten isn't necessarily a bad thing. How can we tell the rest of it? Uh, uh, you just need to know where you're getting it from. So like a, a loaf of bread that's organic sourdough is going to cost you eight bucks. If it costs you like a dollar ninety-five, it's probably not. Yeah. Or make it yourself. Yep. Um, what's your thoughts on protein powders? Oh, don't take protein powders, no. Yeah. So anything like that is is uh, highly processed, it's super heated, and it's only going to take nutrients out of your body, and it'll wreck your digestive system. I've worked in enough gyms as a personal trainer and as also as you know, other jobs to have seen enough destroyed bathrooms mm -hmm. from all the people taking protein powders, mm -hmm. and it's, um, it's, it, it, will, will, it will wreck your digestive system. Um, the protein in it's also not as bioavailable as protein in food, no. despite how it's no. how it's marketed to you. Yeah. yeah, it's all marketing. And, and what about tofu? Tofu? Yeah. Generally not good. It's an estrogenic food, mm -hmm. so it's again it's not a natural food. You can't you can't digest a soybean. It has to be highly processed before you can even slightly digest it. And in doing so, it's also highly estrogenic, which means that it's putting the body's hormones into a state that uh, it's generally not beneficial, yeah. So what would, what you, what would you recommend for like plant-based protein then, the best plant-based? Just a good variety of different, of different foods, okay. yeah. If you're mixing a good variety of various plants and um, mushrooms, like if you can go, if you can just take various sources that are natural and, com and you know, when if you're doing plant-based, you do have to be a bit more vigilant with how you combine things, but okay. you can still do it, okay. yeah. But just stay away from anything that's highly processed. That's I the like beans and stuff. Beans are okay, yeah. Okay. Yep. You just generally want to soak them first. Make sure that all the um, things that you can't digest are broken down. Yeah. Cook them well, and then you should be okay. I'll that. Yep. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, my mum's got autoimmune disease, so mm -hmm. her immune system will attack a variety and more and more foods she can't eat. I was just wondering uh, what you'd recommend or. What your experience is with that. Yeah, well, it depends also on why she got the autoimmune disease and what it is. But generally, the inflammation that's associated with it can be helped with the raw fats. So a lot of the autoimmune diseases are caused by uh, an inefficient metabolic process. It's not breaking things down properly, and it's triggering uh, that immune response within the body. So raw saturated fats are really good. And then just taking out anything that could be causing it, which is anything that's highly processed, the same thing, genetically modified foods. Uh, and then anything that could be bringing a heavy toxic load into the body can help. But it's kind of it's kind of hard to deal with that unless you know the person. Like there's not much general advice you can give for it. But the things like your raw your raw saturated fats are very. Um, Wouldn't there be an emotional? That's the other thing too. A lot of it is caused by by trauma and hanging on. I'll just let you guys know because it is time to break for lunch. I'm happy to stay and answer questions because I'm going to probably go for lunch in an hour. So if anyone wants to stay and keep asking questions i'll stay for as long as you want if you want to go for lunch you well, just go whenever you like thanks for coming Thank you. um thanks so you're welcome um i'll just keep going if there's other questions are you taking new clients are you doing zoom things or can we yeah yeah i will be you? yeah i'm on the gold coast yeah i really would love some extra help yep That's for sure i had asked with colitis yeah yeah i totally understand the emotional connection of why i created it in the first place yeah the pouch that they created inside mm -hmm. has still always had um pouch itis or ibs yeah and now i believe i'm doing um SOBO, small intestinal mm -hmm. bacteria overflow. Mm -hmm. so I have some pain. Yeah, yeah, I'll write my email address for you. 
So if anyone's got specific questions, we'll just we'll keep. You're welcome. This makes so much sense. I'm so grateful that I went past that probably advice and listened to you about the water. Yeah. Yeah, the water thing was big for a lot of people. Mm. It was big for me. Like after my my life changed yeah. a lot from that. Totally, Tom. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Awesome. Welcome. See you later on. I just want yep. to ask you. I had a tiny little shingles a couple years ago, yeah. and I got a bacteria from a dirty kitchen floor, mm -hmm. and it basically ate a patch of the, yeah, flesh yeah. all the way down yeah. to the yeah. flesh. Yeah. That's a good me. question. Can I handle oh, that for people? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So we've just just had a really good question here. I'm um, sorry. What's your name? Christine. Christine. People that want to stay keep asking questions, not just with you. Oh, yeah, and we yeah, can yeah. all learn. I yeah. Think it's really yeah, 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 definitely. So, um, so I had a shaver's cut and I cleaned a dirty kitchen floor and I got a bacteria. And doctor, it ate away a whole patch of flesh that took about three and a half months to grow the skin back. Yeah. But the doctors gave me antibiotics. Mm -hmm. And ever since then, if I eat gluten, basically my skin eat itself yeah that yeah patch. so what happens is the reason the bacteria can do that is bacteria fungus and parasites it decomposes what they'll do is they eat dead skin if you got the same bacteria on anything else the only reason it's going to do that is because there's something for it to eat it's doing its job so it's not it's not necessarily a bad thing it is obviously you don't want to get big mm. wounds in your body but from a you just got to understand that the bacteria isn't isn't there to harm you it's just doing a job and what it's doing is it's actually eating away other residues that are in there as well. So there's things that are in your tissues that that bacteria needs to eat away. That's why it does that. So, yeah. so yeah. So what we want to do is we want to uh, keep the body clean to start with, and that comes from diet, obviously. Diet and lifestyle is cleaning the body regularly. Now, with that specifically, uh, the strongest, one of the strongest natural antibacterials is lime. The lime is really painful to put on an open wound, but it's extremely effective. Mm -hmm. But so is urine. And aged urine is even more um, effective. So fresh urine is really strong, but if you can urinate in a jar and leave it for a while, a lot of cultures in other countries store urine in jars. They do that for things like poisonous snake bites or these kinds of bacteria that start eating away flesh and causing open wounds. Most of the time, we don't close wounds. We just keep them clean. So I did this, and uh, you won't be able to see it that well, but there's a line that goes from here right through my hand to my little finger. That was done by glass in New Zealand. I picked up a box with glass in it and a drop slid through my hand and the glass just went right through my hand. It was really deep and um, I kept it open though. So what happened is each, well, I closed it to start with to stop bleeding. But uh, then I urinated in it every day and put raw honey in it every day. I never got stitches for it, never got a tetanus shot, even though it happened in an old cow paddock, which is where like that's supposed to be tetanus territory. And the, the urine is what helps it to stop going septic. And then the honey helps to heal it. It really clo That closed off within a month, which considering how deep it was, actually stopped bleeding within a week, closed off, but then it healed within a month. So it was really... The quality of the urine stopped doing that healthy. It's still actually... It's still actually really close to your blood. It's even if somebody's really toxic, the urine is still. I'd still use it, but not use it for sure. Uh, but you want to just keep it clean and use foods that are drawing. Things like you can put what's called a poultice on there, and a poultice is things that are made from food that are drawing: onion, garlic, meat, um, different herbs. Different cultures will use yeah, potato, anything that can draw, and you can put that right on the skin and wrap a bandage around it tight. And then after a few hours, five, six hours, maybe you take that off, you'll notice that it's kind of blackened. It's pulled a lot of that out. Yeah. That can do the healing. And then putting things on that are like raw honey with a lot of enzymes in it will actually help to heal the, the, the skin and eggs, raw eggs, things like that. These maybe can all... Maybe solve with um, lime essential oils maybe and the honey? That... Maybe this... Does anyone know the answer to that? Does lime essential oil have the same property as lime? Well, it, yes, it'll be, it'll be it's really extracted. concentrated. It, okay. It yeah. Show us a okay. I'll look it up. Yeah, um, I'm not sure about that. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I actually, I put them outside under a towel when I know if, if I know someone's coming yeah. over and they're like, "What's?" I, I hide them. <laughs> but yeah, I do keep them. Yeah, they're jars because I do keep them because they're um they are really useful. How long, how long do you keep them for? Is there an expiry date? No, no, there's no expiry date on it. No, no. And if you look at uh, Indian culture, like Ayurvedic culture and especially they use urine a lot. They actually drink their own urine daily for being, oh damn, I should have told that young guy that. So um, yeah, yeah, it's to, for people that are plant-based and they don't get enough protein, they, oh thanks, they drink their urine. That's what they do in India. 
because they the protein that's wasted can yeah. go back into the urine they drink it it's actually yeah. beneficial urine for them yeah urine therapy is really big uh-huh. sounds really weird to a westerner that we just that's a waste product but it's not a waste product it's actually blood minus the red blood cells that's what urine is but what about the ammonia uh if you well you could smell if you if your urine smells high in ammonia i probably wouldn't drink it but it's, it's going to have some but it's not it's not um detrimental some people actually drink a lot of it i don't recommend drinking a lot of it but uh, other people drink um just small amounts and they're good like homeopathic doses for example in things like that yeah microdosing yeah thanks for coming thank you so much you're welcome um jj has oh yeah do you recommend like the dutch test like you like do you know what the dutch test is for what um or like, as a doctor, like different doctors, like do like a sample. Like it's like a sample like on day twenty-one of the cycle, mm-hmm. and then you urinate, I don't know, five times throughout the day, and then wherever these ones get sent to America or somewhere, it's a full-on analysis of what everything's doing. It's mm-hmm. expensive, like, but it tells you. Apparently, it's like a fifteen-page printout yeah. um, of your genes and everything. Yeah. Like, and like. Because I want to find out a bit about like estrogen and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. That's what the doctors suggested. Okay. Yeah, and she reckons it's more. Um, it pinpoints things more than like a blood test. Cause blood, she doesn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Know. Okay. I don't know. And I just, I don't know. Like. It's yeah, I'll give. Worth I'll, the money or am I just? I'll tell you what I think about yeah. a lot of that, and then you can like the decision will be yours. But yeah. um, so from somebody that was really sick, I went through a lot of testing and things like that. Now, a lot of it turned out to be not correct. I did double blinds on some of them, got two different answers back from the same samples. And it can sound really impressive to have a large printout of things with this, oh, well, that's me mapped out onto it. But a lot of it's not not uh, right. The reason being is that I won't even use these days, like people bring blood tests at other tests that they've had, they'll bring them in and I'm like, I don't even really look at them anymore because the what's wrong with them is usually coming from the same place and the solution is usually always the same. So what happens is that if you, it doesn't matter what you have, the solution is always get the lifestyle right, balance the diet right, and then, you know, it's, it's always, always a lot of basics. And then it can be really easy to sell somebody on extra consults if you go, this is all of your thing that came, now here's a solution based on that, but it didn't need to be based on that. I was always going to give you that solution in the first place. So sometimes it can be, I'm not saying it's not the right thing to do, but just when I've seen a lot of these things happen, um, they they don't always give like if there's problems with estrogen and testosterone and things like that and imbalances generally they're coming from the same the same reasons so it doesn't so f- what will usually happen there's one called the health lodge in Byron a lot of people go there and they come out with like the health lodge they come out with a bunch of like a chem- they look like a chemist they come out with things of they this pill and that pill well, and and it, and it costs a lot yeah. but that's what those diagnostics do what it does it goes you're deficient here this is this this is that and that's that therefore you need this whole selection of pills but you don't have that situation because you have a deficiency in those pills mm-hmm. you have that situation because of some imbalance that you haven't you haven't got to yet so that's why for me i don't really do those i'm not saying there's no value to it because sometimes there is as a diagnostic tool i feel like there's a Well, some, sometimes it's just the expense too. And like a lot of the things like in Australia, you've got to send it to Germany or the United States. Then like, does it go through scanners? Like where does it go through? Yeah. What happens to that sample before it even gets there? How is it altered? How is, it's yours. Yeah. yeah, how is, yeah, is it yours? Say, how I is the energy? Friend that, like one of, or a couple of friends that have been to her and their weight, they're like, it's really helped them. They're yep. different. Like, so I'm like, oh. It like, can, that's the thing. But, but then they're on like, then it's just like, you need to take this pill and that pill and it's like, oh, I don't, yeah okay well i'll handle this now because this is in, this is like a good general yeah. topic anyway so first of all sometimes you get a result because you've actually made a decision to get a result you're like i am going to handle myself now and this is the uh, this is the journey the journey uh, what's it called the permission this is the permission that i now have to start a healing journey and do we need to leave or can we yeah cool yeah. All right, I'll just handle this question, then we can maybe uh, wrap up. And then, so basically, what happens is that sometimes the healing happens from that. The other thing, though, is that um, with sometimes the result is a short term thing as well. Sometimes it doesn't continue long term. Um, but other times, it's just literally that whole thing of, yeah, this is me now, I'm, I'm on the right step. 
So, but what always has to happen is if they don't handle the reasons they got there in the first place, they'll always end up back there. So if they don't change the lifestyle factors, they don't change enough in the diet, they're gonna end up back where they were before they went onto the protocol. And that's why some people go on, every year they'll go onto a new parasite, fungal, whatever, because it didn't do any, it didn't really, they didn't address the metals that are the reason that the fungus is there in the, fir the first place or the bacterial infection or the whatever. So we really always have to, it's fine to do it as long as you're still also going in the direction of why did I get into this situation in the first place? It wasn't because the pills weren't there. It was because we were doing something or we were lacking something in our life that ended up in that. So I'm not saying don't do it. It's just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because some people do, they get they get um, stuff from it, yeah. yeah. Just so, one, one question yeah. about the, um, the Chinese medicine often says you need to cook food, like raw yep. things. Like, so yep. if you eat all raw, yep. what does that mean? Like, well, because it's as long as it's balanced, that's that's a different thing. And it's also different, like eating a raw vegetable is different to juicing the vegetable. You know, there's two different things. So you've got tea, tea, two things, right? Yeah. That's what they say, like you got them for a reason. Yeah. So if you juice and smoothie everything, then it's not yeah. really... Not everything. Yeah, not everything. Not everything. not everything. But the difference is too, is that Chinese medicine and Ayurveda, it's about 5,000 years old. That's pre-vaccines, chemtrails, pesticides, fungicides, everything that we're exposed to. So what they did then is completely different to how we are now. It doesn't have 100% carryover. Also, in my experience, because I've done it for a long time, what works for people in, for Indian people living in India and Chinese people living in China is different from what works to an Australian or like European descent living in Australia. It's a different environment, different energetic properties, different everything. So it doesn't have 100% carryover and they weren't as toxic as us. That's why um, increasing the amount of organ meats that you eat or increasing the amount of vegetable juice that you have is more important now because they didn't have that need back then and our food sources are, are more nutrient depleted yeah. than they had back then. So it's a completely different world. Mm -hmm. It's not like they have no value, but the carryover isn't 100%. And often people go and get that kind of treatment when they're at the end of the road, like they've yeah. gone too far out of balance yeah. and then nothing works to bring them back. Yeah, that's right. Like, yeah. So yeah, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't cool the body to have raw foods when you're eating a, a variety of it. It does if you're doing all plant foods. Mm -hmm. But when you've got the animal foods in there as well, then it doesn't cool the body mm -hmm. from, that, from that Chinese medicine perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, they're really big, like I know being mostly vegetarian myself, they're really big in saying, look, actually meat is something that's it's, it's good yeah. for you, you know, like you need just small amounts. Even small, yeah. So a small amount, it's not a big steak, you know, just yeah. small amounts here and there. I've seen people just have a small amount of yeah. meat once a month and that's all they need because we all have different bodies. Some people need it every day, other people once a month. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. In your 20, yeah. See, some people don't. Some people, uh, they do, like say, like people in India especially, they're like, it's like I genetically there. The I was just, just thinking that, and I've seen a lot of people who um, yeah. are suited to vegan vegetarian diet, yeah. and their yeah. body is yeah. really responding yeah. yeah. to that. Yeah. It's generally like an A type of blood. Yeah. blood. Yeah. 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 More meat based. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does, yeah, and it's just personal. So you shouldn't you shouldn't eat based on an ideology. You should eat based on what yeah. your body, what body wants. And like for some people, they're vegetarians. For the, like I've got mates that are vegetarians that I jiu jitsu with. They're the strongest guys in the club. Yeah. You know, you, you don't need meat yeah. if you if you don't need meat. But if you do need meat, it's yeah. not a good idea to be ideological about not eating meat and then deteriorate your body. Because I would I've been vegetarian. I got really sick, mm -hmm. and I, I, my body needs meat, so I don't judge it. I don't judge that I was made in this way that needs meat. And so for a vegetarian, it's completely fine when you've got that body type, like you probably have, to suited to being a vegetarian. But we just all have different bodies. That's all it comes I down to. I think the whole thing is about everything fanatic in whatever way, if it's, if it's meant to be religion or, or health or, or crit, anything that gets into that tunnel vision, it's not balanced anymore. Yeah, right? yeah, balance is key for all things, yeah. We should wrap that now. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah, if you want to pull me up. Thank you so much.